been a very long advent. And it might seem to us that this Christ child is overdue. It's hard to wait. As somebody who's had a child go a whole week past a due date, I will tell you, it is really hard to wait with swollen ankles, paying attention to how many days you are past that date on the calendar. When I was pregnant, I used to get these weekly emails that told me how big the baby was, that it was the size of a squash or whatever, <laughs> and what part of its body it was developing inside of me. And this fourth week of Advent reminds me of this unforgettable line from the week 39 email. Now remember, most pregnancies are about 40 weeks, so by 39, you are ready to be done. You are done being pregnant. <laughs> and so the email said this, it's right around this time that there's a slow shift from being perceived as a glowing woman that is creating life into a fat husk that is hoarding the adorable baby that everyone really wants to see. Like, all right, where's baby Jesus? We're ready. Is he here yet? And yet, as we come to this fourth Sunday in Advent, and Jesus still not here, the lectionary shifts us back, not to Mary's last days before labor, but back to the trip where she visits her cousin Elizabeth. Mary has already had her encounter with the angel Gabriel and courageously consented to do this great thing that God will do. She goes to see Elizabeth, whose own pregnancy is another literally burgeoning way God's redemption is being born into the world. The bodies of these two women, <coughs> one who was too old to be considered useful for bearing children, and another who was in real physical danger for being found as pregnant before she was married. These two women are the way God chose to enter human space and time. So as we think about that, let's think about that context into which Jesus will be born. According to our best knowledge, Jesus Christ was born around 4 BCE. That was an unforgettable and challenging year for Jews where Jesus was born. When Herod the Great died in 4 BCE, Jews rebelled all over the land. Syrian legions were sent by Rome to crush those Jewish rebellions, and they burned the city of Sepphoris in Galilee and reduced its inhabitants to slavery. Now, Jesus grew up in Nazareth, which is about four miles from Sepphoris, so any, and no one could hide from these legions. Anybody who was left was killed, raped, enslaved, and those who survived lost everything. Mary and Joseph, Zechariah and Elizabeth would have witnessed some portion of this horror. And into this world, Angel Gabriel comes and sends Mary on her journey. She barely crosses the threshold into Elizabeth's home when John, the once and future Baptist, begins dancing within Elizabeth's womb. She says to her cousin, and why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? In this simple phrase, Elizabeth is the first in the Gospel of Luke to call the child that Mary is bearing Lord. And to us it seems like a little word. We say it all the time, especially here in church. But when we say, and Mary heard, and Elizabeth said, that that tiny being growing inside of Mary, that was developing ears and eyes and lungs and had a heartbeat, that little thing was the Lord. Instead of Caesar, who was sitting in Rome, sending those brutal armed guards to defend the imperial borderlands, in that word, Lord, Elizabeth is making a bold, dangerous, prophetic statement. She's saying God is at work in this tiny body, 
And God is at work in partnership with these two women to redeem the Jewish people who are under Roman oppression and then everywhere else where the weak are kept under the thumb of the powerful. With her body, Elizabeth will birth the one who will prepare the way. With her body, Mary will make flesh the salvation of the whole cosmos. But we're not there yet. We, with Mary and Elizabeth, are waiting, anticipating, maybe even tapping our feet. We hear what Mary hears from her cousin, this testimony about her son. And Mary answers <clears throat> with a song, a song that we've all got to sing and then you heard me read, and you've heard over and over again. And this song we hear over and over again should really forever ban us from that picture of Mary as meek and mild. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, famous Lutheran pastor who died in a Nazi concentration camp, wrote this about the Magna Cot. The song of Mary is at once the most passionate, the wildest, one might even say the most revolutionary Advent hymn ever sung. It is not the gentle, tender, dreamy Mary we sometimes see in paintings. This song has none of the sweet, nostalgic, or even playful tones of our Christmas carols. It is instead a hard, strong, inexorable song about collapsing thrones and humble lords of this world, about the power of God, and the powerlessness of humankind. The power of God and the powerlessness of humankind. This very human Mary is co-creator of the new thing that we can perceive God is doing. The stream bursting forth in the desert, the stalk coming up out of the stump of Jesse. She's both the one God brings this ridiculous plan to, and she's also the one who actually says, yes. And so God is born of flesh and blood into a peasant family, taxed and subjected by the Roman Empire, forced to flee from a government who wants to kill brown babies. And this, this God, born of flesh and blood, will make his ministry among tax collectors and sex workers and freaks and weirdos to show us what God's redemption really looks like. Pastor Naveen Saras, a Lutheran who serves in Wisconsin, writes this. The main point of this reading is that God acts on behalf of Israel. God is at work now and then. Christ's salvation does not only concern the future, but the present time. God brings down the powerful and lifts up the lowly. God is God of this moment and the moment to come. God acts. God acts by Elizabeth's prophecy of her Lord from her unborn son's sleep. God acts by Mary's word, the one that she answers yes to and the one that is growing inside her body. God acts by places like Canterbury and Luther House, where students of all kinds are welcome, whether or not they know the words of the Book of Common Prayer, or they know who wrote the Oxford Confession. God acts when we choose welcome over fear, patience over frustration, and hospitality over distrust. Surely we will gather at this table and we, together, will assemble a small, but there's, there's enough of us here, a small protest against the way the world is, against the proud and the powerful and the rich, even if we sometimes fall into those categories. We show up only with our frail, simple, powerless mortal bodies, and we outstretch a hand. We show up with young and old bodies, with able bodies and those that are not so able, with fat bodies and thin bodies, with brown bodies and white bodies, with queer and straight trans and bi bodies, bodies that know all the words by heart, and bodies that are still learning them. And in our 
of showing up in that God acts powerfully here and now. With our taste at this table, we are given both our identity and our instruction from this God who acts. We're going to say it. Father Ted's going to say it. Mine is slightly different. Ready? Receive what you are. Become what you eat. The body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Receive what you are. Become what you eat. The one who acts to bring peace and justice, that's what we share with each other, and that's who we are becoming for the sake of the world that God so loves. Mary is about to bring to birth the salvation of the world, and we get to participate when we embody her son in who we are becoming. As we share this feast and go back out into the world, where thrones remain untoppled and the empire of many different sorts still rules, as we await this Christ child to be born in our own bodies, I leave you with these words from the Reverend Oliver Rene Bozard. It's called Before Jesus. Before Jesus was his mother. Before supper in the upper room, breakfast in the barn. Before the Passover feast, a feeding trough. And here the altar of earth bear linens of hay and seed. Before his cry, her cry. Before his sweat of blood, her bleeding and tears. Before his offering, hers. Before the breaking of bread and death, the breaking of her body in birth. Before the offering of the cup, the offering of her breast. Before his blood, her blood. And by her body and blood alone, his body and blood and whole being. The wise ones knelt to hear the woman's word in wonder. Holding up her sacred child, her God in the form of a babe, she said, Receive, and let your hearts be healed, and your lives be filled with love, for this is my body, this is my body.